How's everybody doing tonight? Good evening. Fine. How are you, Commissioner? I'm doing pretty good. Seems like we're uh, slow tripping in. I think people are still um, devastated about yesterday's games. Right. <laughs> uh, well, I get to the news. You know I am. Commissioner <laughs> Sanchez is in here. Hey, Law Mark, how you doing, buddy? Good. How are you doing? Uh, I'm doing pretty good. Doing pretty good. Yeah. Are we waiting for Kevin? Uh, no, nah, as soon as uh, Chief Kamala Nathan joins us, we can get rolling since we have quorum. Okay. Deborah, do is there a, do we have to do translation today for this meeting? Uh, no, no translation today. All right, sounds good. Hey, Mark, are you a LA fan or what are you doing, <laughs> what are you, what are you doing this week? <laughs> I'm actually, I want the underdogs, the Bengals. The Bengals? Yeah. That, that 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 was a that was cr brutal. Yeah, that that was a big win for those guys. Yeah, they had lost six in a row, right, to the Niners, the Rams. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Rub it in. They just didn't lose. They didn't lose. They didn't win the one they should have. <laughs> right. Yeah, we we didn't send enough people out there. <laughs> oh, we had a lot of people. <laughs> I don't like the passing game at the end of the game. They should have been running it. Oh, 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 we're getting too much into the news <laughs> here. Let's let's get going. <laughs> uh, let's see. All right, well, the chief is here. Chief Kamala Nathan's in the house. All right, let's go Recording ahead. Recording in progress. All right. Well, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, we are here tonight at our uh, Buildings and Grounds uh, committee meeting. And um, we have Commissioner uh, Sanchez here with us tonight. Tonight, we're going to be discussing three items. Um, and we're just going to go ahead and just get started with the uh, agenda. So, so we're going to go to um, action item. Actually, uh, Chief, Chief Kamala Nathan, I had a, a a small amendment that I wanted to do for this resolution with the uh, Samoa Community Development Center um, is is the who's our attorney for tonight? Is it uh, meet our new general counsel for the facilities division team, Suzanne Kim? She is not new to the district, but she's new to us. So, right. Hi. Nice lots of new people. Nice hey, to Susan. meet you guys. I'm Hello. Suzanne Strucky Kim, and I'm here to support. And yes, I, I'm aware of the request. Okay. Okay. Well, well, welcome to the party. Um, <laughs> I, I'm happy to be here. So, so uh, process-wise, am I to do the formal amendment request now, or do I do it during um, this commissioner discussion? Um, that is a good that is a good question. Um, Commissioner Sanchez, you might know actually. Uh, I don't think it really matters. matters yeah. I don't think it matters. If you want to be on the safe side, you should probably take public comment prior. To, well, I don't. Yeah. Yeah, I'd take uh, public comment, but I don't think the it matters. agenda. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You want me to share the resolution? Well, well I have it. It's um, how, how about this, you guys? So I'll, I'll say it and then, um, you know, we could talk about the item and then we could open it up for discussion. But Let's just, um, tonight we're gonna open it up with uh, section B action item. Uh, item number one is uh, resolution 22125A1 in support of partnership with Samoan Community Development Center. Um, I'm gonna 
make an amendment uh, tonight. I'm requesting an amendment tonight to alter the uh, section where it says Pacific Islander uh, Resource Center to Samoan Education Center. So it, it's going to change from Pacific Islander Resource Center to Samoan Education Center. Okay. And so <clears throat> Um, we're going to go ahead and open it up. Chief Kamala Nathan, do you want to, uh, do you have any, uh, um, do you have a presentation for this title? Yeah, you're on mute. Commissioner, as it's uh, a resolution that's been introduced by you, I have not produced uh, a presentation. Um, the text of the resolution is attached. And the only thing I would add as a note is that a joint use agreement is the appropriate, I think, uh, relationship and mechanism for uh, Samoa Community Development Center um, to establish a more formal relationship with SFUSD. They have been operating on and off in a, on a permitted basis for a while, and I think that this is a better structure that will uh, ensure both entities get the uh, support and resources that they need to do their work at the John McLaren site. Sounds good. All right, thank you. Appreciate that. And I know uh, staff has been working, you know, with the uh, organization. And so, um, okay. So, Justin, we'll go ahead and open it up for public comment. It would be me, Commissioner. Or Deborah, sorry about um, that, Justin. Deborah. If you'd like to speak to this item, can you please raise your hand? Scene one, Commissioner. Okay, we'll go ahead and give uh, that one person a uh, one minute to speak. Okay, John. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can now. Hello? Yes, we can hear Hello, you. Hello, so my name is John Aisha Anna, and I'm currently the Director of Programs for the Samoan Community Development Center. We are currently located in the John McLaren building here in the Visitation Valley and have been since 1996. We started off with uh, one youth program in 1996 and now we're providing an array of programs stemming from programs for our seniors right down to our zero to five population. And we just um, really appreciate the partnership that we have and we think this partnership is very important because SCDC does support a lot of the schools located in the Southeast sector or otherwise known as District 10. And many of those schools receive a lot of support from us in the form of soft um, handoff to families at home who, who are unreachable, um, free someone translation and free someone interpretations, especially when youth are going, undergoing IEPs because we know a lot of our families are get lost in the shuffle and translation. And so we think this partnership has been a blessing and is, is also needed for our Samoan and PI youth. That's it, Commissioner. Uh, I think you got one more hand up. Uh, you got oh, Lynn. I'm sorry. Yeah. Lynn? <clears throat> Lynn? Hello, my name is Lynn. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Sorry. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, my name is Lynn Pelasuma, and I'm a program manager here at SCDC. I've been here for 12 years. Um, SCDC and SFUSD has always worked together to ensure the kids are always supported academically. We do have an array of youth services that include summer program, after school program, academic, academic support, cultural learning, case management, and many more. Um, when the schools closed down due to the pandemic, the classes transitioned to online learning. And our kids were having trouble accessing Zoom due to inadequate Wi-Fi and not having a quiet space to learn. Um, some of our kids had no support in a home because the families had no um, tech experience. SCDC then transitioned into a learning hub. We've had over 80 plus elementary, middle and high school um, students during that time. This past summer, we ho hosted our in-person summer program, which commemorated 25 years of one of our biggest youth programs, which is PIYA. And we had over 150 uh, 157 plus participants. All this continued during the pandemic. Um, we just ask that you take into consideration the importance of our culture, the future of our kids and community and support SEDC and continue to build by providing a space and safe haven for our Samoan and PI youth in SFUSD. Thank you very much. I have Edel, Adele. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. 
Hi, um, Talafa'a, my name is Edelweiss Fabasta. I am the program coordinator for Tupulanga Talavo Tulai, um, a program at the Samoan Community Development Center. Before working at SADC for the past five years, I am also an alumni of the Pacific Island Youth Alliance program, where I learned more about my roots, my culture, and the resiliency and strength that thrives in our Samoan heritage. As a Samoan person raised in the Bay Area, there are rarely, if any, programs made for and by Pacific Islanders other than SCDC and the programs we built to serve the needs of our people. Learning about my culture outside of the home has connected me to the intersectionalities of who I am and has translated throughout my life to be a community leader, advocate, mentor, master's of public health student, and a social justice warrior for my community and the youth that I serve. Learning our language, values, and indigenous ways of knowledge, health, and ways of life, which is never taught in our school's district, has continued to encourage me and the work that I do to share this gift of who we are as people with others. These spaces and conversations are crucial and fundamental for our youth to learn and talk about. We hope you support this resolution and work towards continuing to bring spaces like this to our community that are sometimes lost in the shuffle. Thank you. Okay, now I think that's it, Commissioner. Uh, thank you. Uh, th thank you to the community for, um, for coming out tonight and showing support for the resolution. Um, you know, it's... Um, it's really good to hear the, the history and all the programs and all the work that's being done um, with um, the Samoan Community Development Center. And, and I've witnessed firsthand, you know, all the work that they've been doing, you know, for the years and years and years here in the city. And so um, this partnership, you know, is, is very, like folks mentioned earlier, it's, it's very uh, pivotal and key, you know, to be able to, you know, build on what we've already got in front of us. So, and I think it's going to really, uh, you know, help us in terms of like um, continuing engaging with our PI families and also families in the Viz Valley, right? Some of the Community Development Center does a lot of work in Visitation Valley, and um, this is only going to be uh, a win for the community. And so I appreciate the community for uh, showing up tonight and showing support for the resolution. Um, I'm going to go ahead and see if um, I think it's me and Commissioner Sanchez. Commissioner Sanchez, do you have any questions or? Uh, yes. You want to? Yeah, go ahead. Um, first of all, thank you, Fogo, for the resolution and your, your continued work in this area, and also STDC, the wonderful work that they've been engaged in for years with our district and the community at large. So my question really is, it, it sounds like the, the resolve of the resolution is about finding space in the Southeast area of San Francisco. Can we elaborate on what that space might be? Or do we have any ideas? Uh, Commissioner, if I could respond to that, uh, there is at this time no intention to relocate SCDC from their existing location at the John McLaren campus. I think um, we they occupy uh, a number of classrooms um, and also have shared access to a number of other spaces. Uh, I think the focus of the resolution is that we really enter into a joint use agreement which is a mechanism that allows us to establish a, a real estate relationship with another entity based on other criteria than rent, right? But to really say, we have a mission, you have a mission, our missions complement each other and the work that you're doing helps us accomplish our mission. Um, and so we will be uh, reaching out to SEDC to begin uh, the development of that kind of framework. It's similar, a joint use agreement is also the mechanism we use for the BVHM overnight program at Buena Vista Horace Mann, just to provide a point of reference. Okay. All right. Okay, I, I would, it, the way it's worded, it just made it sound like the, a, a different site was gonna be located in, uh, for uh, the community. It, I, yeah, I think there's differences potentially between the idea of a, um, I guess tonight we're switching the language to Samoan Education Center, that uh, it has not been determined that those are the same. There's Samoan Community Development Center, and then there's the idea of a Samoan Education Center and the extent to which um, and how that education center connects with existing SFUSD instructional resources or uh, otherwise is still TBD. And so I think um, that is partially what is is behind the, the language that refers to a site because the idea of a, a program called Samoan Education Center 
that SFUSD runs does not exist in the district right now. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so just uh, on the logistical stuff around the um, resolution. So the amendment that I you know, presented forward tonight is, do, is there a second and a motion or a motion and a second that needs to be done for that to occur? For the resolution to be moved forward to the full board? Uh, for the uh, for the amendment. Oh, for the, oh. Uh, I can basically recommend that we forward the resolution to the full board as amended nice. with a positive okay. recommendation. With a positive recommendation. Okay, cool. Can you both um, agree? Uh, I hope it is. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> we both got our hands up. Um, so thank you, Commissioner uh, Sanchez, for the support. Um, again, thank you to the community, SEDC, uh, with Patsy Tito, John, Lynn, and Adele, and everyone out there. We appreciate you all. And so um, we'll go ahead and move on to the next item. Great, commissioners. Thank you very much. Just by way of introduction, it's new team member night here at Buildings and Grounds Committee. <laughs> uh, we both have our new general counsel, Suzanne Kim. I want to introduce to you at long last, you've heard me talk about this position forever, but we now have a bond program manager, the senior Aberry. She will uh, uh, provide the next presentation. And then also Karen Sullivan has actually been with the district for a year and helped us reopen um, schools for in-person learning and is now finally to get to do her job, which is around capital planning and real estate uh, portfolio management and just started being able to go to her own office for the first time in the past month. So uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to the senior. Thanks, Don. Good evening, Commissioners. I'm Lucine Iberi, as Don said, in my fourth week here as the Bond Program Manager. Um, so, you know, fourth week. <laughs> I come to SFUSD after about a decade of work um, at the SFMTA in Capital Facilities Project Delivery. And I have a kindergarten student at SFUSD myself. So I'm excited to be here and get um, working on these important projects. I'm gonna provide an overview for you this evening of the 2016 bond program to date. Uh, since I'm so new in this role, I ask for your good grace. And when we get to questions, I'll also likely invite Dawn uh, to assist as of course, she has a lot more history on these projects than I do. Um, so thank you in advance for your patience. I'm glad to eat, meet you both and let's get started. Go ahead, next slide. Okay, so this is the um, budget allocation of the um, $744 million bond that was approved by the voters in 2016. Um, the bond team prior to my arrival, of course, has worked diligently to deliver the capital projects to many of our schools. This breakdown shows the distribution of the original funding plan for the bond. And you can see that modernization projects top out the list at more than half of the total allocation. The district also made a commitment in this bond to technology upgrades, to new school construction, uh, which of course we now know is mission-based school, to a vision for a new art center at 135 NS, and then to upgrades to student nutrition services, green school yards, sustainability projects, and seed funds for teacher housing. Go ahead to the next slide. Um, with the board's reallocation of the, 100, well, of the 135 Arts Center's $100 million last October, the items in green on this slide now represent the approved breakdown. And these funds um, are able to round out the budget for Mission Bay, uh, to add one of the Horace Man as a modernization project, and to invest in comprehensive planning for school improvements in the Southeast, and to pursue schoolyard and site security improvements. You'll see also a million dollars there for uh, more air, air filtration for um, COVID post-COVID or during COVID in-person learning. <laughs> Go ahead to the next slide. So as of today, you can see the ticker mark for today's uh, approximate date there towards the right of the slide. We have completed six major modernization projects. We have an additional three in the closeout phase. Um, two more, George Washington High School and AP Giannini, construction ongoing to wrap later this year. And then Hillcrest Elementary and Thurgood Marshall are an active and ongoing construction through the end of the year. 
we go to the next. Uh, here's a focus on just the active projects, including those, those in closeout. Uh, the ticker line here indicates the upcoming bond sale, where we will seek new bond proceeds to fund the remaining construction costs of, of these and other projects, as well as a portion of the Mission Bay School budget and the design costs for Buena Vista Horace Mann. Um, the bond sale is expected to occur in early March, and I will say a bit more of that on a, on a later slide. Can skip. Thank you. Um, the prior slide was scheduled, and this is just another way to look at active projects by budget breakdown. You might note that aside from mission-based school, which of course is new, new school construction, the projects with the, large, the largest budgets here are also the ones with construction ongoing. Um, this really reflects both the complexity of the projects and the increases in construction over time, including pretty significant bumps in construction costs uh, during COVID. And one more. Um, and so I just mentioned before um, that the bond sale was going to be March. It says February here. So as we have sort of worked together with our internal finance office and our bond council, it's clear that we need a bit more time. So this is now updated to March. Uh, some other highlights for you this evening. Um, so following board approval of the reallocation of funds and newly allocated funds to Buena Vista Horace Mann and in anticipation of the March bond sale, we have assigned a project manager to Buena Vista Horace Mann uh, to lead the project. And we have initiated weekly meetings with the school administrators on site. Uh, we also had a stakeholder meeting um, last week in the evening to initiate the project formally with the community. Um, we have also been briefing commissioners on the Mission Bay EIR in anticipation of the Mission Bay project approvals, which are upcoming in the next few months. Um, that is a super high level update that I have for you uh, tonight. I'm happy to um, elaborate on anything or answer questions. Thanks. Commissioners, I would just also add that now that we have a bond program manager, I also would like to agendize on a monthly basis. Just again, a brief update uh, around the bond program and invite your feedback on both the format and content of that status update. But I think it's a, a, it's a healthy practice for a bond program and particularly as we begin um, the projects that have been identified for this next $100 million of expenditure. Um, it's a good way to keep everyone in the loop. Um. Deborah, could you uh, see if we have any public comment on this uh, item? Yes. If you'd like to speak to this item, can you please raise your hand? Seeing none, Commissioner. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll open it up for discussion. Commissioner Sanchez, do you have any questions? Yes, thanks. Um, can you characterize um, how the BVHM community meeting went and who, how many folks attended, et cetera? Certainly, uh, Commissioner. There were over 50 participants, I think somewhere in the 50 to 60 range, um, a wide representation of, I think, the school community from including staff and uh, families. The, uh, the tenor was impatient but I think that is consistent and understandable uh, given the long arc of advocacy that was required to get us here. Um, we introduced both uh, our bond program manager, Lucinia Iberi, and also Roxana Vargas Greenan, who was the actual project manager, will be the project manager for this project. And they were treated with uh, friendly optimism. <laughs> I think they were greeted with friendly optimism. Um, and also a strong, uh, again, sense of urgency and advocacy to begin moving as soon as possible on the project and to provide uh, more frequent interaction with the community to ensure that we will be as inclusive, urge us to be as inclusive as possible in our outreach and also to provide, I think, a more concrete set of next steps for the project. Do, do you have a scheduled next meeting? Um, we do not have a scheduled next meeting because we are working with site leadership to develop uh, a, a steering committee. And also it's our hope that we will, and this was our uh, the seniors suggestion recommendation 
given the breadth and interest on the part of the community to participate in the modernization scoping, um, that we also pursue hiring an outreach consultant to um, help us reach our goals of 100% participation. And I don't know if uh, maybe the bond, uh, Lucinia, if you have a more anything more recent, you've been talking to Roxana over the past week and might have a more recent update. Yeah, just to note that in last week's um, on-site meeting with the school administrators, they did request that we come back and have another similar forum um, with the community end of February. So uh, we will be putting that together. Okay, okay cool, thank you. Mm -hmm. And in regards to the, um, but the list of um, schools that are still undergoing bond work, capital work, can you um, give some highlights for, for some of the work for example, Thurgood, that's a really large project. And I think Hillcrest is also a large project. Can you just um, talk about some of that? I can that start work? and then I might need Don to jump in because I don't know the details of all the projects quite yet. But I can tell you on the Hillcrest uh, site, they're, um, they are, the, the crews out there are wrapping up the modernization work on the existing building, but commencing construction on the new building there. Uh, we just had a, um, a kickoff meeting for that for the new building just last week. So um, that is underway. A circuit marshal, I know that has a substantial scope on the um, whole educational wing of that building. They're replacing the entire, everything on the, all, all the curtain wall, the big glass wall that you see like from everywhere in the city. <laughs> um, and so it's a substantial uh, modernization project that will go through that entire building and also do a lot of accessibility improvements on the front side. Um, many of us I think are actually already in. Um, but yeah, the construction there is, uh, it's an older building and we do, as, as we have been working through the building that we have sort of uncovered some unknown things. So um, I know that our project manager is, is working to um, address those during the construction. I don't know if Don, if you have anything else you want to add on Thurgood Marshall, I know it's a, it's a big undertaking for sure. Yeah, I think again, that is, uh, is also a large campus. And so I think also seismic scope, for Thurgood Marshall. Uh, I would have to go back and confirm that myself because I often get Thurgood Marshall's scope of work confused with the George Washington High School scope of work where George Washington High School as well as ongoing, undergoing a massive seismic structuring uh, project as well. That is a big driver of the, the cost there. Commissioner, if you give me a minute, I can also look up more notes if you want more detail. No, 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 that's fine. Okay. And then my last question is around uh, West Portland, Denman. Yeah. There, that work is, the design phase is done, right? But the yep. construction won't be covered during this or with this current bond. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that is correct with this current bond. There are funding sources. As you're um, probably aware, we, we do, it is very common practice, not just for our geo bond program, but all school bond programs, and the state requires this, that in order to get state grant funds, you often have to spend your own money first. So we have um, put together and now expended uh, all of our modernization program or have plans to with the board's reauthorization. Um, we are expecting a bond or to say state grant funds to come in slowly over time to reimburse us for some of those early expenditures, but the schedule is unclear to, to myself. And so as those funds came in, come in, uh, there may be opportunities to uh, launch additional projects um, through construction, but the, the price tags on I believe it's Dunman is pretty substantive. One of them is close to $50 million. Yeah. Um, so I think, uh, but as if those funds become available to us, we will be, you know, returning to the board to ask for feedback on the prioritization. But it's likely that a forthcoming bond will have to be passed. Um, I think to get both of them, very likely. And to do get we, both of them, yes. Um, I know this isn't, part of the agenda, but maybe we can have it as a future standing item about the future bond mm -hmm. <laughs> that we can uh, keep that discussion alive. But thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we, we've talked quite a bit about the, the next bond and, um, you know, how do we set ourselves up as a school district to be successful, you know, with, um, I would like to see a poll 
you know, done by the school district um, on what the uh, voter engagement would look like mm -hmm. in terms of putting out another bond. Mm -hmm. um, but I do, I do believe that we we have to do right by the, the funds that we were given in 2016 to be able to show the voters that we can execute. Um, is it Lysenia? Lysenia, yes. Lysenia, yeah. Welcome to the school district. Thank you. Yep. Um, can you talk a little bit about the uh, next steps for the uh, outdoor learning in the Southeast uh, planning in terms of the repurposing, the $100 million repurposing? I know that we, we've been having conversations around it and I, I think you're like four weeks in, so you're probably, um, you know, you're probably already dialed in, but. Yeah, yeah totally, I know everything. Um, I'm actually, I think I, need to, I think I need to punt to Don on that, on that. For, um, to answer that. So commissioner, we have, I have really focused the bond team, uh, both the senior and Roxana's attention on getting up to speed on BVHM and Mission Bay. Um, so I'm happy to, uh, just kind of give an update on outdoor learning and Southeast facility planning for tonight. And by the time we get to our next month's meeting, um, I, I intend to be able to turn over the presentation entirely. Um, so for Southeast facility planning, um, we're, we're making some good progress. There is a small uh, group that is included, that includes myself, um, our Southeast Instructional Leadership, Demetrius Rice Mitchell, Stacey Affleck, uh, Myung Lee, um, Minu Yashar, and um, a few others who have been meeting to kind of work on the plan. Um, and um, in particular, how we will eventually engage uh, site leaders and the public more deeply. Um, but what we have engaged so far is to really work together to think about, um, you know, priorities for the Southeast. And I think one thing that has come through uh, loud and clear is the, the hope and commitment that as we make renovations, we are creating a comparable student experience from a facilities perspective for all students in the Southeast, regardless of which school they attend. So that's, that's something that has emerged as a, a core principle for us. Um, our next item is actually on our capital condition assessment, which is an important precursor for not only future bond planning, but also setting up future priorities for additional capital projects. So we are getting some preliminary data back uh, in the next two weeks of our first uh, few sites, all focused in the Southeast, um, that we asked our capital condition assessment um, to evaluate. We will be getting first data back from that and we will begin to synthesize what that data means in terms of, again, overall costs that are needed to uh, renovate and repair facilities such as uh, Carver, Malcolm X, um, you know, Bret Hart and other schools in the Southeast. We hope then like spring to be able to come forward to the board with a more fleshed out plan that includes uh, potential projects as well as you know, budgets and schedules. For outdoor learning, um, we have begun the conversation again without cash in hand. We cannot launch um, the projects fully. Uh, but we have started the planning process for outdoor learning um, to begin to define more specifically the policy criteria that we will use to evaluate projects and also to look at the pipeline of projects that are available right now in terms of um, projects that have strong leadership, site leadership and sponsorship, um, and have done already some pre-work uh, to think through what their vision is of their sites. Our goal is that next month we'll be able to come back to you and share with you what we think the stakeholder process can look like to engage feedback from stakeholders and again, provide, um, get feedback on uh, potential priorities for the funding. All right, that sounds good. Um, a follow-up in terms of stakeholder engagement, I, if I could remember, there was a conversation that we had that said, um, we would be engaging with partners, you know, around uh, March, um, and and I say that you know intentionally around you know this new relationship we're building with the uh, SEDC, right? Mm -hmm. And so, is that still a realistic timeline uh, for partner engagement or stakeholder engagement? Uh, I know there was a process right now with our internal district and in making sure that, you know, but 
Um, I believe so, Commissioner. We're right now we're on track to meet that timeline. Sounds good. Okay. All right. Um, I don't have any more questions. Commissioner Sanchez seems to be nodding his head sideways. Okay. So we can go ahead and move on to the final item of the night. Uh, what is that? Status update on the facilities division capital condition assessment project. Uh, Chief right. Kamala Nathan, do you have a presenter on this? Yes, we do. Um, I'm joined tonight by our executive director of facility and capital planning, Karen Sullivan. Uh, we have also, this is another project we've talked about for a while that in order to bring more clarity and transparency to our capital planning and determining uh, which sites should receive investment, it's important that in addition to the qualitative data we receive from sites about their experience, um, that we also involve, include uh, objective quantitative data that is collected from the sites on their condition. Um, to that end, we contracted with a firm uh, called VFA, um, who has since been acquired by Gordian Group, which is a well-established uh, construction services firm, uh, to begin a capital condition assessment of all of our properties. Um, very excited about this project, very excited to get the data back from it and share it with the broader SFUSD community. And so tonight I would just introduce Karen Sullivan and um, ask her to uh, go through this presentation for you. Don. Um, okay. So let's see. Oh, so we can go to the next slide. Thanks. Um, okay. So here we have an overview of the scope of the condition assessment process. So from a building perspective, we're looking at 153 total sites, and that includes school sites, administrative buildings, and then um, buildings that are leased out to other entities. Those buildings translate to about 10.4 million square feet. In terms of contract scope, we're looking at this phase of the engagement for two different types of services. One is on-site assessments where a team of two assessors, generally it's um, an architect with an engineer with a mechanical background. Um, the assessors go on-site to each building and evaluate the condition of all systems within the building. In addition to these on-site assessments, we're also getting a barcoding of the major systems within the buildings. So that includes things like a boiler, um, HVAC, elevators, thing, like things like that. Not every system in the building, but major equipment and components. Once the assessors go on site and collect the data, that data is um, compiled and then entered into a cloud-based database system. When, the system. when all of that information is finalized, we then have the opportunity to um, generate different dashboards, um, customized reports, there's some mapping features that we can use to display the data that's been collected and analyze it in a variety of different ways. Uh, next slide, please. So the main metric that's gonna be used throughout the condition assessment is what's called the Facility Condition Index or FCI. And um, on this slide, we have a summary of the FCI equation, but conceptually what it looks at is the ratio of the cost to replace a system within a building or the cost to repair a system within a building to the cost to replace that system. So for instance, if you're looking at a heating system, the cost to replace that system could be $300,000. If the cost, the cost to repair, sorry, the cost to repair the system could be $300,000. If the cost to replace the system is $305,000, that is an indicator that that system is deficient and is in need of replacement. And so when you're looking at FCI, the metric that you're looking at is the closer you get to one, the worse condition a component within the building may be. And then we have some benchmarks here of conditions. So pretty much when you're looking at FCI, a rule of thumb, potentially could be that anything over 30% would be considered in fair to excellent condition. But again, this is all subjective to what that the role that that system plays within the building and how important it is, what a high, how high of a priority it is to replace. Um, next slide. 
And so once you have the FCI data, there's a lot of ways that it can be used to identify which buildings you want to target your investments to. And so um, this slide is an example from the Detroit Public Schools. They had a graph in their condition assessment showing the FCI for the entire um, for an entire building across their portfolio of schools. So you could see which schools are in need of targeted investment. Um, next slide, please. Um, and then this is an example from Atlanta Public Schools. They looked at school sites by category. So I think the interesting thing here is if you are looking at this report, the FCI for elementary, middle, and high schools are all in good condition, um, less than 15%. Whereas the FCIs for other buildings that are used for other purposes are indicating that there's more need for investment. Um, and those FCIs are, you know, of exceeding um, 25%. Next slide. So where we are in the process, um, I think Don mentioned, we started with a pilot at the beginning of January of five sites in the Southeast. The consultant BFA is in the process of um, analyzing that data and is hoping to get us a report, by, a draft report by the end of this week. The week of February 14th, we're gonna kick off the facility condition assessments. So in general, there'll be a team of assessors for two weeks going to about two sites a day or the equivalent of 60,000 square feet. So for like a middle school or high school, sometimes like BVHM, for example, that was a full day. Um, assessment when they were on site there. So um, this is an overview of the order in which sites will be assessed. Um, so there's no priority here. It's just the order in which the condition assessments are happening. So we're starting with the Southeast. The next group will be um, school sites that have not had major work completed since 2006. And then we just move forward from there. So group three is school sites that had investments in the 2006 bond. Group four had investment in 2011. Group five includes school sites that had investments from the 2016 bond and charter school sites. And then group six is administrative buildings and other sites. Next slide, please. Um, this is an overview of our schedule. Our hope is that all school sites, so groups one through five, we will have completed assessments and finalized the data by end of June, early July. Next slide. Um, and then this is just a little more detail on the process, the assessment process and where we're at. Um, so far, we've completed the pre-assessment data gathering. So we provided the consultant with a lot of information on the buildings, including floor plans, um, information from the work order system, other invest information we had on investments that had been done in the building so that when they went to a building, they could go in with an understanding of the space, but also questions about different systems that may be in need of investment. And so right now we're kicking off the site assessments and barcoding. Um, then we'll move over, we'll move on from there on a rolling basis. As assessments are completed, we'll get reports. That information will be analyzed, finalized. Um, and then a thing that we're keeping in mind as we go through this process is what are the systems that we need to implement on our end so that this data can be maintained after the condition assessments are complete. And then ultimately, once all that information has been collected, as Don mentioned, um, the data will be used to inform some of the choices and strategies that inform the capital plan. Okay, and that's it for me. If you have any questions. Thank, Thank you, Karen. Uh, Deborah, can you see if we have any uh, public comments on this item? I'd like to speak to this item. Can you please raise your hand? Seeing none, Commissioner. All right, thank you. Commissioner Sanchez, do you have any questions, comments? Uh, yes, thanks. Um, so this would be used, I think your last comments on the last slide are to partially to inform a future bond or future bonds. Yes, and also all of our capital investment dollars. Um, I think that we are, as a district, supposed to have a 10-year capital plan. Ours has expired. Um, we intend to use this data to help write a capital plan for the district that would inform 
not only future bond investment, but also the use of our developer impact fees and our 3% deferred maintenance funds and um, help respond to the board's questions about long-term strategy for improving ventilation at school sites. So it serves um, mm -hmm. many, many purposes, but it should be considered a core uh, a, an important strategic data set for all the facilities divisions work. Okay, great. Um, and then I think it was 150 some odd sites that we have. Does that include, for example, a site that has two, that's co-located, for example, Moscone Elementary also has an early ed, Las Americas. Is that counted as two or one site? Oh, question. We just talked about that today. <laughs> So like a good example is Leola Havard. So Leola Havard would be one site with an ad, a category for admin and a cat, we'll have an, we'll have a breakdown of admin versus early ed there. So at Moscone, I can't remember the layout there, but if the early ed is within that building, we would categorize that space as its own asset. Um, but if it's in a different standalone structure, it would get its own, it would then have its own entry for that building. It has its own entry, but it's the same complex. Right, so that would be another case where we would differentiate early ed space um, from K through five. Okay, so that in essence would be two sites. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, in our list, it would count as one because it's okay. one site that they're assessing, but in the database, we're okay. going to differentiate. Okay, and then on slide six, um, under group six, admin and other sites, some of these, like for example, the 106 Bartlett, I think 106 Bartlett and 110 Bartlett is the city college site in the mission, um, that they're in the middle of like a 70 year lease with the district. Um, would F, would be doing an FCA on them, like that kind of building? Our intention right now is to make sure that all properties owned by SFUSD get an assessment um, and an FCI score. Um, even for buildings that have tenants, I think the one notable exception is probably the Westfield Mall, um, <laughs> because we are partial. We are uh, we are an owner, but we are uh, a small, relatively small part of the footprint. Um, that uh, it's useful information for us as we also think about again our overall portfolio and the structure of our lease agreements as well. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, th thank you, uh, Karen, for the presentation. I I'm excited. You know, I know we've been um, talking about this for a while now, you know, and so just to kind of see it up and running. I would love to see um, the data and the results on this um, as you guys produce it, right? So I'm excited and um, really excited to see what this capital plan actually looks like. Uh, my question is, um, in terms of building out the capital plan, is there going to be an opportunity for stakeholder engagement to participate in that? Or how does that work out? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my hope is that as the data, I don't think there's much in the way of stakeholder engagement about the data methodology, right? It is what it is to ensure that it's objective and consistent and we can do apples to apples comparisons. It's important that that stay, stay the same as it's applied. Um, but I think that there are two pieces of feedback that we hope to get from the overall community. Um, once we get this information back, I'm really looking forward to workshopping it with different constituencies to say, how does this land on you? Because again, the, the, it is totally possible to have a building that is structurally in great condition, but is functionally failing to meet your needs, right? Where the roof is perfect, it's brand new, the foundation is great. Um, the, the walls are okay, the lighting is okay, but to just say, I don't know, this isn't working for us, right? Um, and so it's a really important that as we think about our capital planning and prioritizing facilities, that we're including um, moments for people to reflect on their user experience as an important uh, piece of feedback in, in addition to the objective quantitative feedback we get from the consultants. So, so that's one thing is that as we get these results and you see all the schools stack up on their FCI scores, a few of them I expect people are gonna be like, oh yeah, of course, right? And then there's going to be an interesting middle section um, that I think it's going to be really important to get feedback from folks to help us distinguish how to prioritize for those like middle grade um, facilities. 
Um, the second piece of feedback that I think is needed, not just from stakeholders, but from the board is um, what kinds of topics, uh, I've got a rough idea of an outline of the capital plan, but I wanna share that with the board and get your feedback to see if there are particular um, you know, chapters you'd like to request essentially, or places where we wanna go deeper on our discussion. Um, the last capital plan had a, a pretty lengthy discussion about demographic trends for the district. Uh, and this version, we might want to comment on student assignment policy and the potential changes to our capital planning as a result of that. Um, I want to talk about ventilation is going to need a chapter of its own. We're going to want to talk about um, outdoor learning potentially. Um, so I look forward to getting feedback from the board as well as we can share our proposed outline for the plan and to see if there are additional topics we would like to make sure are really thoroughly addressed. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, I would love to see a chapter later on when the discussion happens around um, how do we build uh, schools so that they are community schools, right? Mm -hmm. So now they're academic schools. And what would it look like for us to actually build community schools with like full out kitchens with like, you know, mm -hmm. it sounds like something that's getting ready to happen at BVHM. You know, BVHM has like this community school Mm -hmm. um, make up to it but I'm curious to see what the design looks like you know after mm -hmm. you guys finish it because what they have at that place is you know they have organizations operating but long story short right like mm -hmm. what does a community school actually look like right mm -hmm. um, and does the current school setups um, provide us with that opportunity for flexibility um, thank you yeah um, my, my last comments were um, you know I am happy you guys are doing a, look, a focus out there in the Southeast. Um, and I don't know where this lands, but um, you know, I was at Visitation Valley Elementary School the other day and the, uh, the courtyard was like a wave. Like it was, it did this thing where like, if you roll the ball, it, 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 it'll literally roll like this, right? And so um, the, does that fall into the uh, assessment conditioning plan that we're doing right now and, you know, is there opportunity, is, is that a chapter? Like what is, you know? I think um, I'll let Karen talk through the, the methodology, but it's definitely one of the nice things about this kind of assessment is you can actually look at asset classes across the district, meaning you could do a report that just said, let's just talk about roofs across the district and see how they're doing. Same thing for condition of asphalt or parking lots. And what I expect to see are quite a number of both um, schoolyards or sites where the building is actually in okay shape, but the schoolyard might need a lot of work. Um, and the asphalt has aged faster than everything else. So um, I'm super curious to see that data myself. And um, it's another important place to get community feedback where sometimes, again, things can be, you know, all things considered structurally okay, but not working anymore. So um, I don't know, Karen, you wanna add anything? Yeah, no, not really. I mean, not particularly, but just to re like reinforce what Don said, there will be like an FCI associated to pavement and pavement will be broken down from between play yard pavement, pavement on um, like a court, like a basketball court or tennis court, and then pavement in a parking lot. And so you would be able to differentiate pavement in those areas. The quality of the pavement would be assessed. Um, and also the striping is another component of yards that will be assessed in the condition of need for different types of, if that needs to be upgraded or redone. Uh, one more for you guys, and it just came to me, and I actually mentioned this to the chief uh, before. Um, the assessment of windows, when we're doing window assessment, um, I think it'd be great, you know, realistically, if we were to, um, when you're assessing out there in the Southeast and schools like, you know, let me just be direct and open. When there's windows, where there's bullets going through the windows, right? Like, what is our response to that, right? Like, what can we do in terms of like moving forward? Like, what does that look like with the capital condition assessment, right? Like, what is, what is the feedback when you go out there and you see that there are holes in windows, right? Like, what, what does that look like materially coming out of that? And what do we do? And so, um, so I'll just leave that with you all, but would love to see, you know, something that protects the kids, you know, keeps, keeps kids safe, you know, from that lens, you know, so. Mm -hmm. but.
Okay. Can I can I add a couple? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> so one, I'm hoping this is part of it already, is portables. They just have to go. I mean, we can't mm -hmm. have schools with portables in the playgrounds taking up space, playing space, and just not just an eyesore, but not up to par, par as a you know a regular classroom. I just think it's embarrassing and sends the wrong message to our communities. So Cesar Chavez is like the poster child for that. Um, there's a number of schools that we just have to assess that and deal with it. And then chain link fences that look like prison fences. Yeah. Can't have that. Yeah. We just can't. <laughs> we share then, that pet peeve. Yeah. Um, and then playgrounds ought to be equitable across the district. So we can't have a high end play structure at one school on the west side, for example, and have a crappy one or none at mm -hmm. a school in the southeast section. I mean, it's just not acceptable. And that goes for playing fields as well. Um, so we have to have equitable sectors, uh, playground in general, and um, and playing fields. We need playing fields for for schools that want them. And so those are, I hope, all part of the assessment plan that we're moving forward with. Yeah, collecting data on all those different components. I promise I'm going to get us out of here by six o'clock. We got three minutes. And so uh, I think um, I think that's it. You know, Chief did mention one thing around the zoning. We're getting ready to go in the uh, school uh, school assignment and it's getting ready to, to change enrollment. So that'll be interesting in terms of what you all, what comes out of this you know, assessment in terms of being able to structure that. But um, okay, um, Commissioner Sanchez, if you don't have any more questions, Chief, do you have any more comments or feedback? Commissioner, thank you very much. Again, looking forward to providing routine updates on these items and the progress. Really appreciate your feedback tonight. All right. All right. Well, everyone knows the Niners lost yesterday, so <laughs> the Warriors are still playing. The Giants are coming up. We have a whole lot of <laughs> teams that are willing to entertain us. So, you know, thank you all again. Thank you to the staff and the public for showing up tonight. You know, you guys all have a great evening. Thank you all. Great. Thank you.